。中文要变成英文哈，半个小时的时间可以吗？啊，有准备哈。那等一下呢，呃，英文我会跟我会跟我们这个呃，跟我们的讲员讲一下，我会讲的稍微慢一点。那如果说有一些比较不容易听的地方，我会跟大家再再说一下，好吗？呃，请大家有耐心啊。如果说听的时候可能不是很听得明白的话，我们等一下我们可以再再跟大家再讲一下。好，那我现在我现在可以转成英文了哈，可以了，准备了，准备转了哈。OK， all right， I'm going to speak English now. Um, our speaker Dan will tell us about his life experience. And his strong faith in Jesus Christ. So let me、um, introduce him first. We are very, very glad to have Dan today with us.、Um, he was、uh, IBM vice president at IBM,、uh, actually a senior executive, and his responsibility was、um, overseeing IBM's procurement about forty billion dollar, forty billion dollar of spend. So it's quite a huge.、Um, Huge responsibility, and he was very successful at his、uh, young age. became a vice pre became a executive and then vice president. So he was very successful, and yet he's he's been a very strong、uh, Christian with、uh, with faith.、Um, so、uh, he will tell us his story, his life story, a quite intriguing story that、um, how he went through. A very difficult life test, and how today that can speak、um, even stronger、um, faith of God. So、um, with that, let, let's、uh, welcome Dan to to tell us、uh, his story. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's all my Chinese. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good morning.、Um, this is actually my second time at、uh, RCCC. The first time was about five years ago on a Wednesday night. I spoke to a,、uh, a Wednesday night group, and a lot has happened in the last five years.、Um, I really enjoy watching these slides.、Um, you know, God has given me an incredible story,、um, and I'm here. Uh, this morning, because he wants me here, I'm alive today because he wanted me to be alive, and I believe one of the main reasons that I am still alive is because he wants me to tell this story of his love and his grace and his mercy throughout my ordeal of the last of, of basically 2010, 2011, and 2012, and I'll tell you about that. I want to give you. I got to check my time. Um, I want to give you. Am I speaking okay? Speed is okay. Understanding is okay. 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 Oh, is it? Is this better? Is this better? Okay. Okay. I bet you can hear, right? It's okay for you. <laughs> um. So.、Uh, as. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction,、uh, Alex.、Um, I will start with a little background of my、uh, my, my life.、Um, I come from Illinois near Chicago. I came to North Carolina in 1984, so I've been here 30 years. I was with I've been with IBM 30 years, and I've been married to Renee for 28 years this month. So when I get a good job, I stick with it. Get a great wife. I stick with my wife.、Um, I think you know many of us who、um, come to Christ、uh, come from something, from a, a problem, from a disaster in our our life, maybe an addiction, you know, some kind of where we give up our lives and we say, you know, I can't do this anymore. You are. I I agree that you are the Savior. And I agree that I'm a sinner, and I agree that I need you. This happened for me in 1991. I I feel now like I was worshiping my career. I was worshiping my job, and my job was the most important thing. And my family and other relationships、uh, were secondary, and in fact, they were、um, falling apart because I worked so hard and so long、um, to achieve 
things at IBM, and this again, this was back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. And so I came to Christ from what I call careerism. Career was, was my God, and I was doing great in my career, but my family was falling apart. My, my relationship with my wife was, was, um, was poor, and I had a two-year-old daughter who uh, I could not spend time with because she went to bed at 8 o'clock, and I couldn't get home till 8.30, and my relationship with her was just, you know, very, very weak, and I was... Um, I came to a point, and by the way, I came to Christ from atheism. I did not believe in God. I did not believe there was a God. I did not believe in um, religion at all. And I was, I was exposed to what is called apologetics for the first time, which means these are rational defenders of Christianity. It's historical facts. It's um, uh, archaeological facts. Uh, and I and I had that changed my my whole perspective on faith, and so between my life being in a crisis and realizing that there is a rational basis for our faith in Christ, um, I fell at His feet and I gave my life to Him. And the first thing that happened is at that point I was on the fast track, and I got offered a job that was on the slow track. It was a job nobody wanted uh, in an area of IBM that was in the corner. Nobody paid any attention to it. And when I got offered the job, I thought, Ugh, huh, that. I don't want anything to do with that job. I, you know, have you heard the phrase new man, old man? So my old man was the one that was devoted to career, and the new man was my new identity in Christ, right? New creation. But when I heard about the job, I was still thinking old man. And I was thinking, what a terrible job. I, I would never take that job. And then I realized that God had put that job there to save me from this, this uh, devotion that I had to my career. And I needed to step away. I needed to make a clean break from that path that I was on that was, that was destroying my family. And, I, and it, when it hit me, it was like a light bulb went on. And I said, oh, God, that's you. That's your, that's your off-ramp. That's your exit for me to get off of that track and to put you first and to put my family first. And I took the job. And I'm sure everybody said, what, what happened to Dan? Ooh, he must have made him, you know, he must have gotten in trouble because it was just a not, not a desirable job. That was one of the first times that I felt God acted you know, very clearly in my life. And it gave me an opportunity to follow Him or continue on the path that I was on. And it was very, very difficult for me to step off of that path and to follow Jesus. There's a cost, right? There's, there's, often there's a cost. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it the cost of discipleship. So that was an important uh, change. Uh, not, not, not just the salvation, right? But the first opportunity to, to, to repent and to follow Christ, right? And, and do it. That was very important for me. Um, second thing that was very important for me, um, 1993, um, my brother, who was 21 years old at the time, died uh, instantly in a car accident, a single car accident in uh, Illinois. Um, and that was the first, you know, tragedy in my life after I became a Christian. And it was uh, a moment where I had to go, I had to go away into my prayer closet and I had to think very hard about the truth of Scripture because when you're overcome with grief, words like tragedy and senseless and life cut short are just just washing over you like waves. And you have to, I had to fight those emotions with truth. My brother is with the Lord. 
My brother is in eternity. He is in glory. I will be reunited with him. The truth of scripture. And I had to force myself away from the emotion, which you can't make it go away, but you can fight it with the truth of scripture. And it was very comforting for me. It was a, it was a very form, formative time. And I'll tell you one other uh, formative uh, experience. Um, when I was, this is in 1990, my son was, uh, let's say, 94. My son was less than two. He was 15 months old, and his red cell count, blood count, began to drop. And the doctor said, don't worry about it. Come back in one month. We'll check it again. So we came back, and it had dropped a lot more. I'm sorry, I've got to get a little water. I keep reaching for it, but I don't actually get it. <laughs> so... Kenyon, uh, so, so this was occurring, and, and one day my wife was at the doctor with my son, and the doctor said, or my wife called me at work, and I was in a meeting, and this, the secretary said, you need to take this call. I take the call. Um, you need to come home. The doctor wants us to go to the oncology uh, center at UNC for children because the doctor is concerned that Kenyon might have leukemia. Um, she's not sure we need to go there to have him tested. And um, I had to drive from work to home, and I was sobbing, crying the whole way, and I was praying. And the vision that the Lord gave me was the, vision, was the story of Abraham. And Abraham was ordered by God to take his son Isaac to a place on a mountain where he was going to where he told him he was going to sacrifice his son just to show his devotion to the Lord. And by the way, that's a hard story to understand. But that's the story that the Lord put in my mind. And and so I felt like okay, I'm Abraham and I'm carrying my son to the Lord and I'm going to put him on an altar and I don't know what's going to happen, but I felt like I had to let Kenyon go. I had to acknowledge the truth that Kenyon does not belong to me, that Kenyon belongs to the Lord. And I had to, I had to bow before the Lord and say, I, I agree with the truth of Scripture that this child belongs to you. And if you want to take him, I submit to your will. One of the hardest prayers I ever prayed. But I believe that that was the truth. That I was responsible before God to acknowledge that my son belonged to him. So, um, Kenyon did not have leukemia. He was tested and he was, was found to be a, a benign, a, a not, not a dangerous situation. His red count came up about a month later. But I tell you that because these are critical events in my life that helped me, that where God formed my spirit and emphasized these learnings about how when we, whatever situation we face, we need to apply the truth of scripture to that situation. So, fast forward to 2010, I had taught Sunday school for, um, five or six years in the Nazarene Church in Raleigh. Um, and uh, so I had a pretty good foundation of, of Scripture and, and, and Bible truths. And in 2000, and the Lord had whispered to me when we were talking about suffering uh, in the Sunday school class that I taught, um, and, you know, why we suffer and how we should respond to suffering. The Spirit whispered to me that I was going to get my turn um, very quietly it was always there. In 2010, um, after having swollen lymph glands for, for, for a couple of years, I saw an oncologist uh, about these, these glands, and, and uh, he tested me, and he, and he told me that I had chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, uh, what, 
what that is, it's a disease where your body produces too many white blood cells. Um, chronic means that it tends to develop slowly. If you have acute leukemia, you usually have to go immediately into treatment. Chronic leukemia is a little bit slower. Um, they don't treat it immediately. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I had to, again, apply the truths of Scripture to my situation. Um, and some of those truths are, are like, you know, in, in the Christian life, nothing is random. You know, I had, to, I had to decide now, how did I get leukemia? Was I just unlucky? Um, CLL, my disease, 15,000 people in the United States per year get my disease. So was I just unlucky? It was a fraction of a percent. You know, I don't believe that I was unlucky. I believe that everything that happens to me comes from the hand of God. And that doesn't mean that he caused my leukemia. But I know that he allowed it, because I know he's powerful enough to stop it. So I know he allowed it. So as I dealt with the disease, I, was, I told people, I'm on a medical journey, and I'm on a spiritual journey through cancer. Um, it got worse before it got better. It got very bad. Uh, I had a very aggressive leukemia. Um, CLL can be very slow, it varies a lot, and my type, my personal type of CLL was very aggressive. And instead of five years or ten years of, of watching and waiting, we watched and waited for six months. And my white cell count went from 50,000 to 90,000 in six months. So my doctor said, we need to treat it. It's time to treat it. January of 2011, I was treated for six months with chemotherapy. When we finished the treatment and checked again, the cancer was half gone, which is not good enough. Uh, so my doctor said, we need to wait for a little while. And I had this, God put me in the hands of this incredible doctor in Houston, Texas, named Michael Keating. There's probably a picture of him up here somewhere. But Dr. Keating always told me, don't worry, you know, I know what to do here. You leave this to me, I'm going to cure you, which was incredibly um, affirming for us, my wife and I. Um, so he said, let's watch, let's wait a little more, and, we'll decide. and he said, come back in January, and I will tell you how I'm going to cure you. I said, Okay. So I went home, but I got, I got a chest cold, and it, was, it turned out to be pneumonia. And when a cancer patient gets pneumonia, they have to go into the hospital, because it's, uh, your, your immune system is weak. So I was in the hospital, and they did a CAT scan of my lungs to get a picture of the pneumonia. And when they discussed it with me, they said, there's a mass in your lung mass tumor. There's a tumor in your lung, right there. And um, <clears throat> they told me it was lung cancer. They said they'd sent a sample to the pathology lab, uh, and the pathology lab said it's lung cancer. And my doctor said, that's very hard to understand, because there's no relationship between lymphoma or uh, leukemia and lung cancer. But they said that's what it was, and they began, to, they began to test me more to determine whether the lung cancer had spread to my brain or my liver, and they did more tests like that. Um, we, were, we were praying, I mean, to have leukemia, aggressive leukemia, and lung cancer is, you know, a very, very, very bad medical situation. I would, I would, my thought was, no way out. <laughs> Only a miracle. Could, could allow me to survive these two cancers. And uh, so we were praying, because we believe God can do anything. We believe God can cure the worst illness with a thought. We believe in miracles. Um, 
And we were praying for a miracle. We were saying, you know, Lord, again, if this is your will, if, if your will for me is to live 49 years, I accept that. I submit to your will for my life. But we prayed hard that he would do a miracle and glorify himself. You know, it would be, it would be the desire of our heart, but we would give him glory and, and honor if he would do that. Well, a doctor came in the room after a week of testing, testing for the lung cancer. They said, you have stage three lung cancer. And they checked the lymph nodes in my chest and they said, those have cancer too. So you have stage three lung cancer. This was happening during this week. Finally, a doctor walked in. My pastor was in the room with us, praying. And a doctor walked in the room and said, have you heard from the lab? And we said, no. And he said, it's not lung cancer. And, you know, I, I still get, you know, emotional when I say that because we, we felt like we had been witness to, you know, a fantastic miracle, unquestionable miracle of God. So, 11.50, right? Um, so, we were praising God, and we, were, we had gone from the pits, you know, to the mountaintop. And then we asked some more questions about what it was, and they said they had to send them. They think it's lymphoma. I said, is that good? <laughs> they said, well, it's better than lung cancer, because you can treat leukemia and lymphoma together. So they, they worked on the lymphoma at the lab, and they came back and they said, okay, we, we now have a good understanding of this lymphoma. It's the worst possible lymphoma. It's called large, diffuse B-cell lymphoma. And it grows like weeds in the summer. Uh, so they said, it, it's called Richter's transformation. And if you look it up, you will see that most people don't live one year. The average life expectancy from Richter's transformation is eight months. Doc, I didn't know that. I'm glad I didn't know that. I, my doctor said, do not look at the internet. Do not do that. <laughs> Dr. Keating, who had been treating Richter's patients since 1975, he basically said, I can do this, leave it with me, I'm going to cure you. What he was saying was so unlikely, uh, it just amazes me today that he told me, I'm going to cure you. Uh, but what happened is, I had two more rounds of very, very harsh chemotherapy to get the le leukemia and the lymphoma into remission. And then I had a stem cell transplant. My sister was my donor. Uh, they, uh, they, they barely agreed to do the transplant because this tumor was still five centimeters and that's kind of right on the border line of whether you can do the transplant. So they did it, this was December. You saw the pictures, I don't know if you saw the pictures of me in the hospital bald with Christmas presents. I was admitted to the hospital. The first round of chemo was the first week of October. The second round was the fir first week of November, the week I turned 50. And then I was admitted to the hospital on December 15th for my transplant. And my, the actual day that I received the new cells that came from my sister Lori was December 21st. That's called day zero. And on day 11, New Year's morning, her stem cells began to produce new blood cells in my body. And every blood cell, I pray, but they've tested me a hundred times now, every blood cell in my body today was created by my sister's stem cells. They destroyed my stem cells. They destroyed all my ability to make blood. And they, and they infused her stem cells into my body and now all my blood, if you pull my blood out, it says Lori McKenna. <laughs> it, says, it says Lori McKenna right on there, my sister. Lori Rooker McKenna. So uh, I was, uh, the, the, the transplant seemed to go well. After 90 days, they check you again. They check you for head to toe, 
PET scans, bone marrow biopsies, and to the glory of God, there was no cancer. No cancer. So I went from having two aggressive, deadly types of cancer to, having, to being cancer-free in 90 days. And, you know, as I went into that uh, transplant, I mean, transplants are very serious. They're kind of like a last resort. Um, at 10 to 20 percent of transplant patients don't survive the first year. So they don't do it until things are really serious, last resort. But the picture, you know, I mentioned the picture that God gave me uh, when, when I was carried, you know, when I was uh, with my son Kenyon. The picture that God gave me as I went into this process was, it was a conversation really with Jesus. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, I, I believe that's, that's real. You know, the Spirit speaks to us in, in, in ways. The Spirit spoke to me, and Jesus, you know, Jesus spoke to me, and he said, um, I got a job for you. It's going to be difficult. Um, I want you to carry this cross up this hill. And I know you don't know what's going to happen. I know you don't know whether you're going to survive. But I know. I want you to trust me. I want you to carry this cross. I want you to do it well. I want you to give me glory and praise. No matter what, Dan. And uh, I said, you know, I'd really rather not do this. <laughs> if it's possible, I'd like this cup to pass from me. But not my will, but yours will be done. And so as I, that was my spiritual posture as I began this, this treatment. Um, and again, I think it's, I think it's biblical. I think that any trial that you face, number one, it's not random. You weren't just unlucky. Everything that happens to you was, comes from the hand of God, whether he allowed it, he certainly allowed it. Spiritually, biblically, we have to know that he allowed it. And we also have to know that he has a desire for us to give him glory and praise and honor through these difficulties. We worship and we're saved by a, by a, a God, man, Jesus, who was acquainted with sorrow. He was pierced for our transgressions. By his stripes we are healed. He was a man who suffered enormously for us. There must be something important about suffering in the Christian faith. We would be nowhere. We would be condemned without the suffering of our Savior. So when we face suffering, I think we can, we can be confident that there's a reason for it. That there's, there's an opportunity for us to become more conformed to the image of Christ. And there's also an opportunity for us to point to our Savior and say, this is the reason that I don't despair. This is the reason that I don't fear death. This is the reason that I'm more concerned about you than I am about me. I think that's incredibly powerful. And as I've recounted to you some of the, the most important uh, events in my life, um, I, I know that that's why I'm standing here today, is to give you that message. Let me tell you a, a statistic, and by the way, I praise God that I am not a statistic, because if I just looked at statistics, I would have, I would have despaired. Um, 500 people, approximately 500 people every year in the United States are diagnosed with Richter's transformation. So in 2011, if there were 500 people diagnosed with Richter's in 2011, there are probably about six 
that are still alive. That is how deadly Richter's transformation is. I've been cancer free for over two years now and it's only by the grace of God. Again, I, was I unlucky before and now I'm lucky? No. God has written this story. Every single word of this story God has written. And uh, I am uh, greatly um, humbled to be able to you be used this way to give Him praise and honor. I want to just, one Bible verse, two, really, two. Um, <laughs> Romans 8.28 and 8.29, I would call them my life verses. And, and so I, I quote them differently. I, uh, maybe I should read the, the NIV translation. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the likeness of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. What that says to me is that God is working in all things, including these incidents in my life. He's working in these things for the good of those who love him, which includes me and includes many other people that were witness and, and you know, to my story. He's working in those things for our good. It's important to remember that our good does not just include this life. We are eternal beings, right? We are going to be with God in eternity. And so when we look at how things affect us, we can't just say, well, that didn't seem like it was very good. Because God's view of what's good for us includes eternity, not just this life. And the second part of it is the co being conformed to the image of Christ. I don't think you can be conformed to the image of Christ if you don't suffer. It's such a critical part of his mission and what he did for us. So it's a different way of looking at suffering, and I hope that that uh, it helps you in, in trials that you may be going through, or trials that you may go through in the future. Um, I'd just like to close uh, with a prayer, if I might. If you bow your heads up. Our Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your plans for our lives. We acknowledge that you are the creator of all things, that you know all things, and that nothing happens to us that you're not aware of, and that you uh, that are outside your plans. We ask you to lead us in the way that we respond to your, uh, the events that unfold in our lives to give you glory and to look for the opportunities that you give us to grow and to become more Christ-like and to be witnesses for you. I thank you for this blessed time, this great opportunity to, to talk with these people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Dan, very much. Um, Dan is very busy, um, so we are very um, appreciated uh, that um, he, he came today. Um, you know, God is amazing. Today in our service, a worship service, remember what was taught, the verses? <coughs> the same one, passing, let the, the cup pass. Oh. So we talk about that in, in the worship, all right? And the other thing I want to mention to you, see all these big, uh, beautiful pictures that Dan, after um, it was last year in the summer, right, after all these, he went to um, um, Yosemite. Uh, what's the name of the mountain again? John? The John Muir Trail. Yeah, John Muir Trail. 22 days, right? Is it 26? 27. Yeah, 27, I'm sorry. 27 days. He packed, you know, there's no, no vehicle, nothing. You have to do all yourself, climb very high the top. And he did that after all these happened. So it was amazing that how much power and strength that God can give. And, and so I think all of us, that's, that's one message I, I, I hear today. It's all of us here, right? We've got to look up to that, that limit. It's limitless, right? The power that God can place in our life that if you trust Him fully, that we, you, me, everyone can be empowered. Okay, so uh, 
Yeah. Okay, so we have. We do have a question. Do you yeah, take yeah. questions? Take <laughs> okay. questions. Yeah. Dan, uh, my name is Roy. Uh, let's see. Uh, you have very good testimony, and um, uh, your your journey is is very uh, uh, very uh, uh, say uh, encouraging. Now, I have a question for you right now. How do you live your spiritual life and career life? Uh, I believe it's still working, right? Uh, yeah. 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 So, uh, how do you balance this? This a life, uh, you know. Among, you know, we all all have careers here. Mostly, I guess some probably will will retire soon or, or, or later. So, mm -hmm. just want to see all yeah. your experience. So, um, I, you know, when I gave my life to Christ, I gave my career to to Christ as well, and it, it is kind of miraculous that even though I, I made that decision, he still lifted me up in my career to, to vice president. Um, one of the things I decided very early in, in my journey was I was not going to leave Raleigh. You know, in IBM, you know, it's a good idea to travel and to, well, not, I did travel, but not, I didn't move. Um, and and I, I just put, you know, boundaries in place that I thought God would, you know, would be honoring to God, like being home for dinner and being able to have dinner with my family and, and limiting travel to, you know, 25%. And I, and I put those boundaries in place and they were different than everybody else. You know, everybody else was working until 8 or 9 o'clock. Some people were traveling two, two thirds of their time. But I put these boundaries in place and I said, you know, God, I trust you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to limit my overtime, limit my travel, um, not work on the weekends, and I'm just going to trust you, Lord, to provide. Uh, because that's what he asks us to do. Um, and and uh, the, you know, the, um, there were times when I was promoted, even though I worked less hours than anybody else. And I would just give glory to God for that. I mean, the, the way God was, you know, worked in these situations to um, give me opportunities. Now, when I, came, when I came back from cancer, I went into a vice president job, and I decided I couldn't do it. I decided this story that God gave me, I wanted to, I wanted to spend time ministering to people, speaking to groups.